Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the CACI International Fourth Quarter and Fiscal Year 2024 Earnings Conference Call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, all lines are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will announce the opportunity for questions and instructions will be given at that time. If you should need any assistance during this call, please press star zero and someone will help you. At this time, I would like to turn the conference call over to George Price, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Rochelle, and good morning, everyone. I'm George Price, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations for CACI. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are providing presentation slides, so let's move to slide two. There will be statements in this call that do not address historical fact and as such constitute forward-looking statements under current law. These statements reflect our views as of today and are subject to important factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from anticipated. Those factors are listed at the bottom of last night's press release and are described in our company's SEC filings. Our safe harbor statement is included in this exhibit and should be incorporated as part of any transcript of this call. I would also like to point out that our presentation will include discussion of non-GAAP financial measures. These should not be considered in isolation or as a substitute for performance measures prepared in accordance with GAAP. Let's turn to slide three, please. To open our discussion this morning, here's John Mangucci, President and Chief Executive Officer of CACI International. John? Thanks, George, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us to discuss our fourth quarter and fiscal year 24 results, as well as our fiscal 25 guidance. With me this morning is Jeff McLaughlin, our Chief Financial Officer. Slide four, please. CCI delivered strong results in the fourth quarter, closing out an exceptional year by delivering 20% revenue growth during the quarter. For the full year, we delivered revenue growth of 14%, coming in ahead of our guidance, which we increased several times during the year. We delivered EBITDA of nearly 800 million, with an underlying EBITDA margin of 10.7%, consistent with our guidance. We also generated free cash flow of over $380 million and free cash flow per share of $17, the latter an increase of 41% from last year. And we won over $14 billion of contract awards, the highest in company history, which represents a 1.9 times book to bill for the year. Nearly 60% of that award value this renewed business to CACI. We continue to perform very well on our recompense. Slide five, please. The outstanding results we delivered in fiscal 24 are a testament to our successful execution of a consistent, well-defined, and market-aligned strategy. A key enabler of our performance is business development. And as you can see, our BD team's performance has been exceptional. Our fourth quarter awards alone were 5.4 billion, representing a book-to-bill of 2.7 times. These awards add to an already impressive list of wins we have discussed in recent quarters. In fact, we have won seven awards of $1 billion or more in the past two years, which supports our ability to drive long-term growth as these programs ramp over multiple years. Our strategy of investing ahead of need, bidding less and winning more, focusing on larger and longer-term duration opportunities, and proactively shaping those opportunities enabled CACI to win significant new work in fiscal 24. In addition, our focus on superior execution, which is foundational to the culture and always a top priority, further supports our growth through sole source extensions and expanded recompetes. We are in the right markets, delivering high value differentiated capabilities and executing at a superior level all of which support our ability to grow free cash flow per share and deliver value to our customers and shareholders. Slide six, please. Let me highlight a few of our fourth quarter awards that bring the successful execution of our strategy into focus. First, we won the eight-year $2 billion NASA Consolidated Applications and Platform Services Award, known as NCAPS. DCI will deploy an agile scale delivery model to standardize and centralize software development for more than 200 systems across NASA, enhancing quality, efficiency, and speed of delivery. These are critical outcomes for our customers 
and we invested ahead of need years ago to develop industry-leading agile software capabilities, identify and shape the right opportunities, and show our customers the art of possible. With the NCAPS win, CACI is now executing the three largest agile programs in U.S. government, and we see a healthy pipeline of additional opportunities where these capabilities will continue to be a differentiator. Second, CACI was awarded a $100 million contract by the U.S. Army to provide signals intelligence and electronic warfare systems for the Terrestrial Layer System MANPAC program of record. Our MANPAC systems enable dismounted soldiers to conduct signals detection, direction finding, and electronic attack while on the move, supporting the Army's multi-domain operation and helping to dominate the electromagnetic spectrum. As we have discussed before, this is an increasingly critical domain, and one where the U.S. is still in the early stages of modernization and investment. This award also highlights the progression of a customer moving from purchase order awards to acquisition of our technology via a program of record that will contain larger volumes and a single award. This provides for a more consistent award basis and enhances the visibility of our business. Lastly, I'd like to highlight two new expertise awards that illustrate our deep domain and technical knowledge, our industry-leading talent, and the opportunity to inform our technology. We won a six-year, $239 million task order to provide intelligence analysis and operational support to the U.S. Army commands in Europe and Africa. Every day, we see the headlines of how the U.S. and its allies face increasing national security challenges across these regions which is driving enduring requirements and resilient funding. DCI is uniquely positioned to assist the Army in anticipating and responding to these fast evolving and complex threats. We also want a 10-year contract worth up to $450 million to provide operations and technical support to the Joint Navigation Warfare Center, part of the U.S. Space Force that focuses on positioning, navigation, and timing, or PNT, for the U.S. and our allies. PNT capabilities are a critical national security priority and an area where we have invested ahead of need in both technology and talent. This new work with the Space Force provides opportunities for future expansion as well as the potential to inform our technology investments over time. Slide seven, please. Turning to the macro environment, we continue to see healthy demand and a strong pipeline of opportunities. Customer demand continues to be driven by the elevated global threat environment the evolving capabilities of our adversaries, and the rapid pace of technology change with this significant need for modernization across government. DACI's expertise in technology are intentionally aligned with enduring and well-funded national security priorities, including the electromagnetic spectrum and counter UXS, application and network modernization, cloud migration, cyber, and intelligence analysis. And this is true not just for the United States, for our allies as well. From a budget perspective, government fiscal year 24 was supportive of CACI programs. We believe government fiscal year 25 will be no different. We are monitoring the GFY 25 budget process, and overall the budget is shaping up in line with our expectations. Like most years, we expect the coming year will bring, will begin with a continuing resolution. And as I said, this typically does not have a material impact on our business, and we are very comfortable with the funding levels we see at this time. Slide eight, please. Looking back on fiscal 24, I'm very pleased with the execution of our strategy, our exceptional contract awards, and our strong operational and financial performance. Combined with the constructive macro environment, this provides a great foundation for CACI as we enter the new year. With that in mind, in fiscal 25, we expect free cash flow per share growth of 11%, revenue growth of 6% to 8.5% on an underlying basis, which excludes the non-recurring $200 million of materials last year, and EBITDA margin in the high 10% range. Jeff will provide additional details on this guidance shortly. Our FY25 outlook is consistent with our value creation model, which, focus, which is focused on driving long-term growth and free cash flow per share. In fact, I want to share that we are making changes to both our long-term incentive plan and our short-term annual bonus plan. Going forward, 
half of CACI's granted long-term incentive shares will be performance stock units tied to a three-year free cash flow target. Additionally, we have added a cash collection component to our short-term bonus plan. The result is that we're focused and incentivized on delivering value to our shareholders. That is our commitment. I look forward to updating you all as we progress through the year. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jeff. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. Please turn to slide nine. As John mentioned, we are very pleased with both our fourth quarter and fiscal year 24 performance. Not only is it continued strong performance, but it's very much in line with what we've communicated to you throughout fiscal year 24. In the fourth quarter, we generated revenue of $2 billion, representing nearly 20% year-over-year growth, with 19% of that being organic. The balance was generated by the four acquisitions we've made over the past 12 months. EBITDA margin was 11.5% in the quarter, consistent with our expectations, and a 60 basis point increase year over year. Fourth quarter adjusted diluted earnings per share of $6.61 were 25% higher than a year ago. Greater operating income and a lower share count more than offset a higher income tax provision. Operating cash flow for the fourth quarter reflects strong profitability and record day sales outstanding for DSO of 46 days as we continue to manage improvements in working capital. Free cash flow of $135 million for the quarter represents good sequential and year-over-year increases. <laughs> Slide 10, please. Turning to full year results, we delivered significant top-line growth, strong margins, and good cash flow. In fiscal year 24, we generated $7.7 billion of revenue, representing over 14% total growth and just under 14% organic growth. This performance was well ahead of our initial expectations. You may recall that when we provided our initial FY24 guidance last year, we discussed a number of factors that could drive results toward the upper end of that guidance. We outperformed on most of these factors. In particular, stronger win rates on new work, faster ramp up of our awards, and successfully defending our recompetes. Underlying EBITDA margin of 10.7% for the year was in line with our guidance, which is a reminder excludes the impact of non-recurring $200 million of no margin material revenue recognized in the first half of FY24. Fiscal year 24 adjusted diluted earnings per share were $21.05, up 12% from the prior year, despite both a $21 million increase in interest expense and a tax rate that was 250 basis points higher. Delivering 12% year-over-year growth despite these headwinds underscores our robust operating execution. Operating cash flow for fiscal 24 also reflects strong profitability and cash collections that drove free cash flow of $384 million, which represents a 36% year-over-year increase. We did not receive the $40 million tax refund related to prior year tax method changes that we discussed with you last quarter and was in our fiscal 24 guidance. The IRS has accepted our treatment of the method change, and we now expect to receive the refund in fiscal year 25. Slide 11, please. The healthy long-term cash flow characteristics of our business are modest leverage of 1.8 times net debt to trailing 12 months EBITDA, and our access to capital provide us with significant optionality. We remain well positioned to deploy capital in a flexible and opportunistic manner to drive long-term growth in free cash flow per share and shareholder value. Slide 12, please. Now I'll provide some additional details on our fiscal year 2025 guidance. As is our practice, we undertake a bottoms-up program-by-program forecast, plus our expectations for new business by specific opportunity. For fiscal year 2025, we expect revenue between $7.9 billion and $8.1 billion, which, as John mentioned, represents growth between 6 and 8.5% on an underlying basis. EBITDA margin is expected to be in the high 10% range. We expect adjusted net income to be between $505 million and $525 million, 
which translates into adjusted diluted earnings per share of between 2244 and 2333 and does not contemplate any share repurchases or acquisitions that might occur during the year. And finally, we expect free cash flow of at least $425 million, which equates to free cash flow per share of about $18.89 and growth of approximately 11% from last year based on our full year diluted share count assumption of 22.5 million shares. This free cash flow guidance reflects the influence of three factors. Slightly higher DSO compared to our current record level, inventory growth associated with ramping technology programs, and cash usage associated with Q4 accounts payable volume following that quarter's strong revenue growth. Additional details of our guidance have been included in our presentation to assist you with your modeling. I would note that we again expect higher profitability in the second half of the year versus the first half. In particular, we expect Q1 fiscal 25 EBITDA margin to be consistent with the first quarter of last year on an underlying basis, which was 10%. Similarly, we expect a steeper ramp of free cash flow during the year, and I will remind you that a myriad of factors can skew quarterly trends, such as the timing of material purchases and higher margin technology deliveries. Slide 13, please. Turning to our forward indicators, our prospects continue to be strong. As John mentioned, fiscal year 24 awards were over $14 billion with a healthy mix of new work and recompetes. Our trailing 12 months book to bill ratio of 1.9 times reflects excellent performance in the marketplace. Our backlog of $32 billion increased 22% from a year ago and represents four years of annual revenue. The weighted average duration of awards that went into backlog in FY24 was nearly six years. The longer weighted average duration equates to less revenue contributed in any one year, but together these metrics provide good visibility into the long-term strength and cash generation potential of our business. As we enter fiscal year 25, we expect approximately 84% of our revenue to come from existing programs, with approximately 10% from recompetes and 6% from new business. This is consistent with how we started FY24 as well. We continue to have a healthy pipeline of new opportunities. We have $9 billion of bids under evaluation, over 90% of which are for new business to CACI. We expect to submit another $14 billion in bids over the next two quarters with about 80% of that for new business. In summary, we delivered outstanding fourth quarter and fiscal year 24 results. As we look to fiscal 25, we expect another year of good performance with healthy growth in free cash flow driven by good top line growth and strong margins. We are winning and executing high value enduring work that supports increased free cash flow per share, long-term growth, and additional shareholder value. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to John. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go to slide 14, please. In summary, we had a fantastic fiscal 24. In a volatile and rapidly changing world, GCI delivered expertise and technology that made a difference to our customers. And we also delivered on our commitments to our shareholders. We want a significant amount of high-value new work, delivered with excellence on our programs, and successfully defended our recompetes. We continue to invest ahead of need in both our capabilities and our talent. Our performance builds an increasingly strong foundation for growth in fiscal 25 and beyond. We are further demonstrating alignment with our shareholders by focusing incentive compensation on free cash flow generation. The business we have built over the last 10 years is well positioned to deliver long-term growth and free cash flow per share and increasing value for our shareholders. We built a leading business development team and they are winning in the marketplace, capturing larger, longer duration awards. We've driven significant improvements in margin and DSO with a continued focus on execution, working capital management. Our leverage of 1.8 times will allow us to deploy significant capital that will have meaningful benefit for our business and our shareholders over the long term. And trust me, we're not done yet. Finally, as is always the case, our company's success is driven by our employees' talent, innovation, and, and commitment, enabled by our culture of integrity and ethics. To each and every CACI employee, 
thank you. I could not be prouder of what you've done to contribute to our company and to our nation. To our shareholders, I thank you for your continued support of CACI. With that, Rochelle, let's open the call for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 again. If you are called upon to ask your question and are listening via loudspeaker on your device, please pick up your handset and ensure that your phone is not on mute when asking your question. And please limit to one question and one follow-up. Your first question comes from the line of Bert Subin of Stiffel. Your line is open. Uh, hey, good morning, uh, John. Good morning, Bert. Good morning. Um, great, great quarter. I mean, pretty impressive to see almost 20% organic growth, so pretty unusual for this industry. As we think about um, FY25, I mean, you've won a ton of work in FY24, and some of that has come in, um, you know, as recently as this week, too, into FY25. Can you just give us a little bit of, um, you know, color on how you're thinking about the ramp up for new work in 25, and then maybe how you're how you're going about ensuring execution is not going to be an issue. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, labor to be added just to to go after uh, the awards you've won. So I'm just curious how you're thinking about those two things. Yeah, Bert, thanks. So let, let's uh, talk about ramp, but let's uh, start that uh, discussion around uh, how we came out of 24, because I think it's instructive as to how we ramp when we get to 25. Uh, if we look at our three major program wins that uh, played into our revenue growth in 24, uh, Focus Fox, uh, approximately 90% ramped that uh, drove a material portion of our 24 growth. Um, ICAS and Spectral uh, provide additional ramp, but better than we originally planned, which drove uh, additional growth. And then on contract growth from all our other programs were a little more net positive over programs that were ending, and that provided the uh, remainder of our, 20, our 24 growth. So that's how 23 awards are uh, unpacked in 24. If we look at... Um, how we how we uh, look at FY25 going forward. Focus Fox mostly in the base, a small inc incremental growth. Um, ICAS and Spectral more material growth from 24. Uh, with Spectral, will be starting their um, LRIP phase most likely during the third quarter. It's going to require higher than normal working working capital. Um, and then, look, we've talked a lot about the difference in wrap times, uh, converting awards to revenue, um, as you've all asked, between expertise and technology programs. Uh, this should be the use case on what we mean every time we have the discussions around, around ramp, so we can all model uh, growth better in the future. Uh, in fiscal 25, we have multiple technology programs ramping in total to just above the ramp value of Focus Box when we went through 2024. And that fact should be very instructive because technology programs do ramp over five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, so the fact that we have multiple technology wins that are $8 billion of, of awards in total ramping the same value the Focus Fox did does show the difference between expertise and technology ramp. Now clearly, technology jobs drive so many other positive areas so they don't immediately go and in, go into the base, and that's what drives residual growth. You're seeing that with ITAS and spectral going going forward. Uh, let me also uh, uh, finish the ramp piece. That some of the eight billion dollars of awards are software-driven type technologies. I, I, I talked about the TLS Manpack job. Uh, that's going to have a higher percentage of working capital uh, that's going to be required. I mean, frankly, we're going to support the maturation of our products which is going to help drive even longer-term free cash flow share. So what we should all hear in that is timing, timing of when that free cash flow per share growth comes. Um, and, uh, look, we did our best estimate of how this is going to unpack for, look, if timing accelerates or starts to unpack sooner in the year, then we get to the right goal post, which is what we did in 24. Uh, if some unpack lighter or later in the year, there's the left goal post. Five of our major seven programs that we won we won during the fourth quarter, 
So that's going to have that's going to play into how that how that ramp um, uh, changes. Uh, you also asked about execution, and it's a, it's a terrific question. Look, we're uh, we've got a line organization that recognizes that we're getting larger and broader, and that we need to continually ensure commonality of process so that we can reliably deliver. We have a stellar knock on wood track record of um, operational excellence throughout this company. It truly, as my opening remarks stated, it, it is in the culture of this company. Everything we bid comes with an eye on how we're going to ex execute this job. And that, that gets into how we price and how we bid our large expertise jobs. It also gets into the terms and conditions we're willing to accept on our large tech, technology, technology jobs. Um, as for staffing, um, you know, we just started our fiscal year 25 with a, with the top leaders, uh, senior leader leadership off site, where our HR organization talked a lot about staff and a lot about the fact that, you know, Zoomers are the new boomers. And, you know, how are we going to source talent, not only by degrees, but by the skills that they have. So part of it, Bert, is making certain, we're making changes in this business ahead of when we have to, to make certain that we can enhance skills of our current employees. Uh, and also look at uh, uh, skills-based hiring. So we're very confident on the execution piece. The one question mark always is how these things are happen. That's uh, very helpful, John. Um, maybe just for my follow-up for, for Jeff, uh, balance sheet is uh, in extremely good shape. I mean, on a trailing 12 basis, you're at one eighth. On a four basis, it's even lower. Um, can you think about or can you sort of help us understand how you're thinking about um, uses of the balance sheet, I, I believe, can you confirm that that's not included in your guide? So, you know, how are you thinking about that as FY25 goes through? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Bert. Yeah, it, it, our guide presumes no share repurchases and no acquisitions. Um, you know, and we fully expect to do, you know, at least some of that, obviously. Um, we've talked about this before. I mean, our, <laughs> our key approach here is about being flexible and opportunistic. We uh, we keep a pretty close eye on uh, on the acquisition target pipeline. Uh, we are you know constantly evaluating those things. John may want to evaluate or may want to comment a little more on targets and evaluation, but they really uh, this is a result of uh, you know this. I think we've said it before. A pretty disciplined, rigorous analytical process. That part is science. The art is sort of marrying that with our view of what's in the pipeline and the rate at which things, you know, may happen or not happen. So I'll let uh, I'll let John talk a little bit more about acquisition targets, but that's sort of the framework, which is no different from what we have done in the past. Yeah. So look, we uh, we consistently get questions on how the M and A market works. I mean, we are a serial uh, acquirer acquirer. Uh, we like to fill long term gaps. Uh, with uh, with other uh, with other companies out there, uh, you know, frankly, the M&A market's looking better. Uh, some of the potential targets would provide the opportunity for us to fill long-term gaps uh, based on our market strategies. You know, some are going to be in the electromagnetic spectrum area. Some are going to be in cloud and AI. And others are going to be in sort of the C4 ISR and cyber area. Although I will admit that electronic warfare is is you know continues to sort of connect. SIGINT with cyber, with EW, with AI, machine learning, and all. Uh, Jeff already mentioned it, uh, but I'm on a foot stop that we're a disciplined acquirer. We're not buying revenue. We're buying capabilities, customer relationships that allow us to sit on these calls for a number of years talking about how that acquisition, you know, one, two, three, seven, ten years back set us up very, very well. Uh, we're going to balance that uh, with a healthy leverage. And as Jeff said, a watchful eye on measurements of stock valuation and uh, determine the best way for us to uh, deploy capital, both in the short term uh, and in the long, the long term. So, Bert, thank you for your uh, questions. Your next question comes from the line of Kai Von Rumor with TD Cowan. Your line is open. Yes, thank you very much, and a spectacular book to Bill. So, uh, John, um, what is the you know forty percent of your uh, of your bookings I guess were um, were, were recompetes? What percent of your sales up this year are recompetes, 
And secondly, you mentioned the, you know, the relative growth of tech and expertise. What should we look for for, you know, tech and expertise? If you kind of hit your sales code, goal, you know, how fast are each of them going to grow? Thank you. Yeah, Kai, thanks. Um, yeah, so 40, uh, 40% of our last year awards were recompetes. Uh, 10% of our, um, of our 25 revenue is based on winning 25 recompetes. Uh, I'll tell you in 24, we were north of 90, 90, 90%. We did an outstanding job of, you know, protecting what is ours that we believe should still stay ours. Um, so that, uh, that worked out, worked out fine. Uh, when you talk about uh, what you should expect in the future um, around, um, I lost the question. The question, question was what were the relative growth of uh, relative rate of growth this year between technology and expertise? Yeah. So if if we look at uh, from a revenue side, Kai, if you look at how twenty five plays out. Um, the larger percentage of our new business wins were in tech, but as I shared earlier, those are going to ramp up more slowly than our expertise wins. Very much similar kind of the way 24 ramped, right? We had a large ramp, um, a large, uh, quick ramp up of the, of the um, large Intel program in 24. So the expertise wins we in 25 will ramp up in the same manner. We're doing a great job of staffing. Uh, on the technology side, uh, we've got a number of um, new wins that are going to ramp up, you know, slowly, similar to what we saw in 2025 and then 24. What I, what I think I would guide you towards is sort of how we do our guidance, right? We've we've got to assess um, a lot of very very variables, both on how the customer acts and how the market acts. Um, you know, if we look at guidance and how these new programs ramp and how last year's ramp. We always look at win rates, are they lower or higher than what we assume? Our program's gonna ramp more slowly uh, or more rapid, rapidly. 24 is a perfect example where we put the guide right in the middle and the majority of the things broke to the right goalpost versus the left goalpost. Uh, funding, I, I believe will still stay funded. Uh, how quickly customers uh, issue our RFPs. Uh, the other uh, factor, uh, Kai is that um, six percent of our revenue in 25 will be based on new wins that we pick up in uh, 25, right? So that's gonna that's gonna force customers to get our fees out and also make decisions in a um, in a timely manner. If they make timely decisions faster, then it'll break more towards the right the right goalpost. So look, we would expect that 25 is gonna play the same as 24. Uh, you know, we have an election year. We can talk a lot about budgets and all, but um, uh, I like the hand that we have. Great. And uh, maybe give us an update on where we are with Photonics. I guess a big focus last year was on completing your investment, and this was going to be the harvest period. Uh, where are we in that? Yeah, Kai. So I, I believe on previous calls, we I was I was quoted as saying we're sort of we were in the seventh inning of uh, investments and in, the, in the bottom of the first on uh, deliveries. Um, look, the majority of investments are are complete. Uh, and that got us to a reliable design on our uh, photonic optical terminals. Look, we're always going to have investments in producibility, uh, maturation that's going to continue to require both CapEx and, you know, working capital as we move forward. But I'm very pleased with the position that, uh, we're in. Uh, we, we, we delivered in the, in the mid-teens terminals during FY24, Kai. We're looking to deliver six to eight times that volume during FY 2025, and that's going to take us somewhat up that curve of, um, of deliveries uh, while we're still entertaining additional bids and, you know, other applications of where we can take photonics. Um, you know, I, and I think that photonics is another example, as TLS Manpack is, and the fact that we're going to move towards spectral production, uh, most likely in the thir third quarter, those production-like programs uh, really connects to Jeff's prepared remarks around additional use of working working capital. You know, it should be clear now that the percentage growth in our business is not the predictor of working capital, but more importantly, as you always ask, how these programs ramp, the type of programs that we're delivering. Very little capital, 
uh, very little capex around the expertise programs, but you know, materially more as we look at, at technology, as it should be, because that's going to be the larger growth budget. Thanks, Ty. Your next question comes from the line of Peter Arment of Baird. Your line is open. Hi, Peter. Hey, thanks. Uh, good morning, John. Good morning, John, Jeff, George. Um, hey, John, uh, just, you know, to, uh, to echo everyone's results, terrific results. Um, $14 billion contract awards, and then we think about, you know, pipeline of new bids, and you've got, I think in your chart, you had next two quarters, you've got $14 billion of bids that potentially, I guess, be submitted for 80% of its new business. Do you think, how do we think about, like, either the, your mix from a, a contract structure, either it's cost plus or fixed price, and, or however you want to explain it via technology? When you look at this pipeline, do you see this kind of mix changing, or is it a lot of it still in the same wheelhouse of, of where you've been in, in previous awards? Yeah, Peter, you know, every time we hear $14 billion, it's a record, right? I mean, it's, it's quite awesome. Um, you know, now what, I, what I'm going to make sure I say at least once on this call is that awards are lumpy. Um, you know, you all you all know that I'm not fond of, you know, telling a record, uh, but I, I have to um, uh, admit it's, a, it's, it's an awesome um, uh, delivery. Look, um, let, me, let me start with, I think, how we got here, and I, I will talk about mix between contract type and what you all can see, but I think it's important to sort of take a slight step back and just make sure we all understand, you know, the hand we're playing is not by accident. Uh, our job is to ensure we continue growth in everything that we that we do. Uh, those awards are a result of working really hard to stay focused on our long-term strategy, which is really hitting your rear markers that to me are the sign of a business that's intentional and not opportunistic. We can talk about where the drone threat is. We bought a company nine years ago to worry about a dramatic spectrum and where drones are going to end up. And yes, we bought maybe a little bit ahead of customer need, and we put some uh, worthy investments. And that's the beauty of our M&A plan, right, is that we're looking for those long, narrow, deep streams of funding. Um, where, we, where we sit today, where we can talk about great growth and, you know, great free, free cash flow per share, um, is having a strategy that's intentional. We really try to find things that are at the nexus of the needs of the customer that need software-based solutions that can keep pace with the threats that, they, um, that they're facing. Um, the repeatable BD process <clears throat> is creating quality captures. Um, and when we look at how that mix comes out, we expect it to be, you know, always more technology than expertise, but it's lumpy. Um, why do I say that? It doesn't mean that expertise work is not of interest to us. We've won some phenomenal jobs. It just means we can be much more selective. Okay, and most of those expertise jobs, Peter, are going to be uh, uh, time and material jobs or cost plus jobs because in many instances the customers sort of know the kind of support that they need, but that always changes. On the technology programs, you know, a, a lot of the work is going to be a mix of cost plus and fixed price, right? And what, what we enjoy since our solutions are software-based is that let's get the design done under a cost plus framework. And then let's move to a fixed price production side. Uh, you know, when your when your production, quote unquote production, is I don't know, 60, 80 percent software based, it's 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 not as risky as bending bending metal, right? Uh, you can make changes more swiftly. Spectral, perfect example. RFP four years back, customer awards it. The threat completely changes. You know, customers every day more excited that they selected us over everybody else because we're able to use software to make changes to that program to actually stay with our original LRIP production schedule. So uh, I think you're going to see the contract mix move move around. I think it will always be predominantly cost plus, Peter, um, but a nice uh, part delivery model where we're delivering to purchase orders, and, and we well should deserve higher margins because that's our investment dollars, making sure that we're there to support our customers. The next question comes from the line of Mariana Perez Mora with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. This is Samantha Styro on for Mariana. Um, I guess just double tapping on those 
submitted bid pipeline and what you're expecting to submit in the next two quarters, how should we be thinking about the win rate on those new opportunities? And then also kind of a breakdown, are those new opportunities or like new, new opportunities or takeaway contracts? Gotcha. Um, you know, one, I would expect that the pipeline plays out um, consistent with last year. Uh, you know, I'd love to be very predictive on win rates and all. And if I was, I'd probably be in a different business. Um, but look, I think we're doing the right, the right things. Um, we're not bidding on things that are out of our sweet, sweet spot. Uh, it's all within the market sphere that we serve. Um, <clears throat> there's so many factors, frankly, that goes in, in, in into win rate. Uh, I'll also tell you that a lot of this is timing. You know, we had $5.7 billion of awards in the fourth quarter. You know, be it, be it by two weeks, we might have had $2 billion less than and had $2 billion, you know, in the first quarter now. So, uh, but I think what's, what's important and foundational is when we share those numbers, it's not so much the numbers, it's the quality of things that we're, that, that we're out there chasing. Um, you know, we're not getting really nice, strong win rates by accident. It actually is a function of a great line and business development team working together with our, with our client-focused folks, making certain that what we're bidding on is a quality, quality bid. Um, <clears throat> so, look, um, I like the odds of us winning more than not. Um, what what's, we feel confident about is we did some prudent work on what our potential win rates are, and that went into our current, current guide. And again, if win rates improve as they did in 24, from where we see their, their potential now will be at the, you know, upper end of the guide. If, if they're not there or they get delayed, then we can be slightly, you know, towards, uh, the left end. But nice quality, similar type mix, um, more technology than expertise based and all focused on at or above the, uh, current margins that we produce today. The second part of that question about the new content, the $9 billion under evaluation, about 90% of that is new to us. The $14, that we, $14 billion we expect to bid in the first half of FY25, 80% of that is new to us. And then for those new contracts, um, what kind of gives you the confidence that CACI can – win market share for any of those that are maybe a takeaway contract where there's a different incumbent now? Um, kind of what gives you that confidence? Yeah, it gets back to the rest. The recipe we, we put in place a number of years ago and we continue to build on. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're going to be involved in programs where we've spent a number of years shaping what we believe the art of the possible is for a customer. So a typical capture for us starts two to three years prior when the RFP comes out. A great example is our NCAPS job, right? So we're very, very well steeped in agile software development and how we uh, deliver and how we can uh, rapidly update what our customer needs. So that was foundational on the NCAPS job. The second piece was spending three years with the customer. How do you like the value that's being delivered to you today by whoever your current deliverer is? You know, if they say they're not extremely happy and that they'd like to take this somewhere else, then we sit with them and show them the art of, art of, art of the possible. And then based on that, we'll invest ahead of customer need and we'll put investments in place to make certain that that customer gets a comfort with working with us. That's over a thousand days before the RFP comes out. And if we're to that point, that we pretty have a pretty good idea of how the customer operates, the type of contract fee vehicle that works for them and us, the level of budget that they have to plan, plan for. And then if you wrap that, you know, the sort of frosting is putting the right key personnel in place, that is the recipe for a Spectral win and a large Intel customer enterprise win, I for expertise win. And it was the recipe that brought $2 billion you know, multi-year and caps award to us. So we have some history here. It doesn't always, always work, but it uh, gives us the confidence that we're spending precious bid and proposal dollars on growing the business versus spending a lot of time re-winning stuff that's already in our, um, our uh, revenue. Thanks for the questions. 
Your next question comes from the line of Robert Spengarn with Melius Research. Your line is open. Good morning. This is Scott Micus on for Rob Spengarn. John, I wanted to ask you a question. So Spectral was a big award for you guys that we normally would have expected to go to the large traditional defense primes, but you leveraged software to deliver a solution there, and Northrop and RTX actually joined your team on that. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on other opportunities where you think your software capabilities can be a differentiator to win larger programs that typically would go to the primes. Yeah, look, uh, you know, one, one, one thing, speaking of the, you know, primes, they're, they're phenomenal companies. Um, they all build uh, eye-watering platforms, and we should be proud of everything that those companies do. Um, we just believe here that there's a level of mission that we can deliver uh, more agilely uh, and in a manner that allows customers to address threats at the speed of the fight. And I actually believe wholeheartedly that's a better value proposition to our customers who are facing uprisings all around this globe. Um, so when we looked at software and the uh, teaming, you know, look, we partnered with Northrop and with uh, Raytheon, an outstanding team. They sweetly augment our spectral delivery, okay, because they have uh, expertise in areas that, you know, we don't. And that's what our customers want us to go, to go do. Leave with software lead with agility, connect with partners who can provide the other pieces that we don't provide, uh, and then give them uh, an experience and a set of outcomes that are absolutely eye-watering. I shared in CAPS, that's a customer that has, you know, 200 or so different systems and apps that need to be continuously updated in an agile, agile manner uh, across uh, all of NASA. Um, you can look at the counter UXS threats. Uh, it's the same step and repeat, okay? What we do on Spectral, you know, all software processing below the deck plate, taking threats and signals and what is that, how do I find it, and how do I rid that of my world is similar to what the counter UXS fight is. You know, and frankly, there's a lot of companies that are looking at these level one and two drones that are not what's wreaking havoc across the world. Okay, these are, you know, these are um, large country uh, state actors, level three, four, and five drones that are very complex. That change their tactics and their um, their their TTPs, you know, every every other hour. Um, so there's a large amount of work in the counter UXS world. Uh, there is also, you know, where do we take things like spectral? Where do we take things like ITES? Where do we take things like Ed's Army? Uh, it's a step and repeat model. And once customers feel comfortable that a software-based solution is actually better and quite more in the current decade of what this customer base needs, uh, frankly, the, the opportunities is not our worry. The opportunities uh, base is for us to select the right ones. And those are gonna be with customers who are willing to change. You know, so and it's going to be changing how they how they buy. Having the army move to a program of record to buy, you know, exquisite actual electromagnetic spectrum um, technologies is a major step forward. And as investors and cell site analysts, don't pass that because that is extremely important. That is called acceptance. And to wrap up, a customer like the United States Navy picking CACI, a software powerhouse bringing other traditional vendors along is also another marker that says that that part of the market is ready to buy to them. Thanks. I'll stick with one question. All right. Thanks so much. Your next question comes from the line of Matthew Akers with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good morning. Thanks for the question. Uh, I wanted to ask about free cash flow conversion. I, I think in the past, uh, CACI has been kind of well above 100%. So, it, you know, I, you, you guys are a little bit below that this year. It makes sense, some of the working capital. Um, but I guess do we get back to that 100% or, or is there something sort of different about some of this technology work that maybe a little bit more more working capital intensive? Now, thanks for the question, Matt. You you should continue in the, in the you know, longer term or even medium term 
to think about us as 100% uh, net income conversion. We happen to have a confluence of factors here in, uh, in the ramp of new programs, as well as sort of finishing up a couple years of non-recurring items that are kind of anomalous, and we're working through that, of that phase of our cash profile. But steady state uh, over time here, uh, over the next year or two, we will fully expect to be back in that sort of a range, and that's the way you ought to model us in the longer term. Got it. Thanks. Thanks. That's helpful. And then I guess one more, just the um, you know the O and M outlays data. I think a lot of us look at every month. It's, it's been pretty weak lately. Is, is there any any um, kind of signs you're seeing from your customer that would would explain it, or any, any way you can help us sort of understand um, you know kind of the difference between that data and what, what seems to be pretty good growth for you guys? Yeah. Now, um, look, a couple a couple of things there. Uh, one is when we have an extended CR as we had while we're in government fiscal year 24, what traditionally happens is that that spend at no greater than, you know, last year's spending rate, that really bottles up all in O&M spending early in the year. So you're going to see customers with more uh, O&M towards the end of the year as they get to the uh, end of September. And that's something that we're watching. You know, we're a big modernization through sustainment company as well, and it's those O&M dollars that could bring some additional growth. Um, so it's both of those things. It's nothing that's uh, extraordinary, but what you'll see is they'll, they'll, that O and M dollars to be to be placed is going to be larger the longer you see a CR go uh, forward. So uh, similar to other other CR years, but you know a nice a nice trend. It also allows customers to uh, reappropriate funds to go after more urgent needs. And you know I would I would put out there that in my my lifetime. There, I've never seen a time when there's so many urgent urgent needs across uh, numerous uh, command commander theaters, where some of that end of the year O and M money may get may get placed towards uh, defending some of those those threats. Thanks, Matt. Your next question comes from the line of Toby Sommer with Truist Securities. Please ask your question. Yeah. Hey. Good morning. This is Jack Wilson on for Toby. Um, if we couldn't we just double click on sort of what you're seeing in terms of recruiting sort of top tech and expertise talent, and if you've seen any sort of change in your retention or attrition in the past sort of couple months. Yeah, thanks. You know, I made some uh, a, a reference to our senior leadership offsite earlier uh, uh, in our fiscal year, second week of July, and it really talked about how the workforce is changing. You know, it's nothing that's going to happen tomorrow afternoon at three. But it's going to be something that is starting to show its hand. Uh, and a company like ours that's very strategically based, we talk a lot about markets we serve and investing ahead of customer need. We also invest ahead of talent need as well, right? Because we don't generate revenue with great awards if we don't have talent. Um, look, we're, we're very focused on how do we, as a company, <clears throat> look at taking people into the company with a skill set that frankly, across the majority of things that we do within five years, that skill set's going to be uh, not fulsome enough to do the work that we need to do. So how do we internally, how do we build uh, a program that's not just about leadership training and some additional training, it really is about core skills upgrading. Um, you know, we get, we get folks in this company as Zoomers, and 20 years from now, everything that they came to the company with is going to be completely different, right? So, uh, you know, good news is we are a strategic company. Strategy is a place where we, we come from, and our, our uh, HR department, you know, got all of us on board saying, here's how we're going to have to hire differently. Here's the kind of skill set programs. Here's the changes in our internship program to make to make certain that even while folks get to us as a sophomore in college, you know, frankly, it'll be three years if they're part of our company and their skill set's going to, going to need to be augmented. Um, how are we doing? About 50% of our work fast force comes from referrals. Um, about 25% uh, of all the openings in our in our company are filled by someone else within the company. So I'm doing this today. I want to go do that tomorrow. Maybe I need a skill set upgrade. You know, pull in pull into the uh, to the ramp and, and get your skill set training, and go back out on the you know track doing different work for us. So look, I'm really happy and really confident. Uh, retention is up, attrition is down, 
again, something else that doesn't happen by accident, uh, great first line leaders, making certain that we're, you know, uh, uh, keeping folks here with us. And frankly, you win 14 billion of awards or last, last year double digit awards uh, on the things that matter in markets that matter, that are well funded. If you're a, uh, you know, younger employee here, new to the work, the workforce, I'm gonna pick a company that's software minded because that, that implies change. And that change implies opportunities, uh, and, we'll, and we're going to uh, invest in, in them. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. We'll turn it over. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of David Strauss with Barclays. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. David? David? Uh, just on the um, – you know, the margin profile throughout the year. So, you know, last year without the material purchases, you know, you were around the 10% level in the first half and, um, you know, 11 plus in the second half. Sounds like you're you're implying a similar profile this year. What what, what explains that? Is that vol just volume or is there something else that explains that, you know, first half versus second half difference in, in, in margins? Yeah, thanks, David, for the question. It, uh, we have over, as you know, we have over the last couple of years uh, developed a pattern of having higher volume and higher margins in the back half of the year uh, over the first half, and it really relates to customer buying patterns. It's not a, uh, you know, it's not a mysterious thing, but we have certain customers and certain, particularly technology. Uh, solutions that you know seem to uh, that that fall into that those periods in the year. Uh, it's just uh, you know it's customer buying behavior. And on the uh, you know to put a fire point on on cash flow. So uh, Jeff, it looks like you know maybe you're assuming about a hundred million dollars of working capital usage for the for the year is that right and then um i guess a couple go and then section 174 is this the last year of that impact and i guess the last question i had was you know, your book tax rate you're implying a bit higher this year uh you know what's driving that change thanks yeah thank you so the working capital uh i'm probably not going to get into the specific amounts but it's sort of on that order um and it's split across the three things that I mentioned in my prepared remarks. Um, the let's see, what was the other one? The tax rate. Uh, the tax rate from the midpoint of our guidance range uh, is about 160 basis points up. It's driven by several things, but the two real drivers in it are a higher blended effective state tax rate, which is just the distribution of the income that we generate uh, by state, moving around a little bit to higher rate uh, jurisdictions. And then the second thing is last year's increase in the UK statutory rate, we have now for uh, for a full year. I think we had it like seven months last year. So we now we have it for a full year. And then the section 174, uh, no, it, it continues, although it's declining, uh, in accordance with the guidance we've given you before, I think about twenty million a year, but there are uh there are two more years of that to go. Thanks, David. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Seth Seafman with JP Morgan. Your line is open. Good morning, Seth. Good morning. This is Rocco on for Seth. Rocco. Um does CACI have any work directly or, like, second order related to Ukraine that could be at risk if the U.S. cuts off funding? And if so, would you guys be able to size it? Um, yeah, thanks. We have um, a non-material amount of work in the terms of revenue that we're doing there. Um, I really can't size it beyond that, and I probably can't say much more than that other than know that you all know the kind of technology that we deliver and what we do, and um, you, I'll leave you to your assumptions there. But it's not from a revenue side, Rocco. Um, it's not there. There are other international customers that are looking at what it is we uh, deliver, and in future quarters we'll be talking about how we're building out what our international strategy is there. But uh, I think that's probably all I can talk about. 
Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And then how is CACI progressing on integrating AI into the contract award and execution processes? Yeah, we've got about 200 programs that have some version of AI in it. So as I've mentioned in the uh, uh, past, um, look, we're, we, are, um, we are on the mission side of many of our customers. Since we're on the mission side, we're on the data side of many of our customers. We're well-versed, everything from visualization to uh, computer vision to machine learning and all the other, you know, elemental P acronyms around AI. Uh, it's it's um, it's sufficient to say that the fact that we're software based and on the highly technical side, and we actually deliver things that we like to call AI today versus advise on it. Uh, we've been pretty steeped in it. A lot of it is in the intelligence community, so we don't talk about it a lot. But you can only imagine, given where the world threats are today, the fact that we are present in every combatant command, the fact that we're responsible for protecting troops and defending this nation. Uh, this is a company that actually uses and delivers AI uh, to the folks who are building and looking for mission technology to sort of get an informational advantage. So uh, we've been in AI for a really long time. Uh, we continue to be in it for an extremely long time because everything we do at the mission level with our software-based technologies have demanded for decades that we understand how to do more with less and how to process more our data faster. So thanks. Thanks, Rob. Seth. We'll take the final question from the line of Sheila Kalyalgmu from Jeffries. Your line is open. Thank you, guys, and great quarter. Um, John, Jeff, maybe two questions for you guys. First, on top line, if that's okay. Um, so, John, on top line, you talked about the technology ramps as being um, a reason that the revenue growth is maybe slower and expertise ramps faster uh, than the book to bill might suggest. Why is that? Can you just distinguish that? Is it constrained by the customer or just timing of that hiring, onboarding, or material receipts? If you could just talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's take the, ex the expertise side first, right? And I'll, and I'll talk at, a, at, a, at an uber high level. Um, you know, when we win a large program that's on the expertise side, um, it's traditionally work which is out there today that a customer may be adding some additional scope to. But at the end of the day, when we talk about expertise, the customer is procuring talent, or we used to call that labor hours. Um, so you sort of get a leg up with the fact that you're going to look at folks who were currently on that previously held contract. So you can immediately move people to start to build to that contract and address that customer's need. It's also their expectation, right? There's many contracts we sign. It could be an eight-year expertise contract for a billion dollars with a 60-day startup window. So within 60 days, 90% of the job has to be staffed. And that's just the nature of how that work works. When we look at a program like, let's, let's use uh, Spectral, um, you know, that is a design and development program, uh, deep on technology, deep on software creation, uh, first article testing, and then building kits beyond, beyond that. Just by its nature, uh, you're not looking at labor hour build up, you're actually looking at outcome and, you know, units of, out, of outcome. So those, those programs, even at your major primes, are going to start up slower. And, you know, there, you know when, you, when you see a, a major fighter jet program, there's eight to ten years of design work, you know, before you get to the larger uh, uh, revenue bill. So at a, at a high level, that's how we see it. So when we, we announce more technology when she was in expertise jobs, that should be a huge clue that, okay, this is longer duration. It's going to ramp up, you know, more over time, which really gets to some of my uh, introductory remarks that we have a number of programs that are technology wins that are going to ramp up at the same revenue delta that a, that a single large expert, expertise job is. So hopefully that's helpful. No, that, that really is. Um, and then maybe just kind of adjacent to that and a bigger picture question on profitability for the industry. Obviously, you guys are demonstrating growth. The customers changing, you know, the example with the Army buying software, acceptance of what they buy. Why isn't profitability for the industry better given the software offering? How come the, you know, how could you change what, how the customer buys from you? Yeah, well, look, I, I think we've done a material job of getting the customer to buy different, different, differently. Um, 
let me let me let me split a hair that may help. Um, when we talk about software based, there's still a hardware element to it, but it's software based. So when customers buy technology from us, they're looking at the ability to say, okay, so I bought um, I bought the phone, but I wanted to put different apps on it for a really long time. I'll use a commercial reference there. Um, when we hear about the government having trying to buy software, today they buy licensed products, think commercial shrink wrap software. Um, it is a licensed model. I we frankly don't believe in a licensed model because that, that puts our customer in a really rough spot. And yeah, it may juice margins for you know a couple of quarters, but we're serving a mission that is how do I buy something that's gonna be enduring that we continue continue to mod to modify. So our software delivery and the fact that we've actually had a customer need and we deliver on a purchase order, those for us are the three elements that allow us to drive margin. Uh, look, we moved from a you know 80% margin to the high tens. We're we're still consistently focused on how do we drive both top and uh, bottom line growth. Clearly, free free cash flow per per share benefits from either and or you know both of those, um, and that's what we're looking looking toward. So. Look, I, I have to give our customers chops that they are working through how do they address today's threats more rapidly, and frankly, that, that gets yourself to a agile software model. And the fact that there's very few people who do it well, right, differentiation uh, drives margin, right? It makes the ask heavier. Uh, and then uh, some of the terms that we're willing to accept, and the last lever is, are we doing some of our software in a firm, firm fixed price manner? The answer is yes. You know, we understand how to do it well. Uh, we're able to sell it in a slightly different different manner. So I like how this company is set up uh, for us to continue to drive bottom line, bottom line growth. Thanks, Sheila. One more, thank you. One more question came in from the line of Louis De Palma with William Blair. Please ask your question. John, Jeff, and George, good morning. Good morning. Um, and this is rehashing several of the earlier questions, but um, the awards in the book to bill this quarter were um, superlative, and 70% of the awards were for new work. Are you assuming a slow ramp for the new work in terms of you know, it taking you know several years to reach? peak run rate, and also for the first year of the new work, is the margin initially dilutive? And so should we expect, you know, for these sets of contracts that, you know, the revenue run rate will increase in year two, and, and so will the margin? Yeah, Louis, so uh, let's see, on the um, on the 70% new work, uh, you know, how, do, how does that ramp? Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the expertise work is going to ramp up quicker. There's a higher percentage of technology in our uh, in our fourth quarter awards and our full year awards, as you mentioned. Uh, so that is going to ramp up slower. Uh, based on the contract type, really tells you how the how the how the bottom line ramps. You know, how um, how prof profitability and EBIT is generated. Um, on the technology programs that have firm fixed price elements to it will be in an EAC model, and yes, we will hold back some of that uh, profit dollars based on risk, and it's a well, you know, a well-defined process that, that's got back up as to how much risk we still have to burn off. Um, but on the other technology work that we have, you know, I'll let Jeff make, make, make any other comments, profit's going to follow, you know, revenue because it, because it, it, is, it, it is cost plus. Right, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I would also uh, we start by noting that was 60% new, not 70. Uh, and and I would just echo John's margin comments. I mean, the ramp uh, is as you would expect. We are slow to slower to uh, uh, you know we protect protecting our early booking decisions. Some uh, you know some development work and the cost type work. Generally, uh, you know the margin is what it is right out of the gate. Great. That's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. That concludes our Q&A.
Thank you. That concludes our Q&A session. I will now turn the conference back over to John Mengucci for the closing remarks. Thanks, Rochelle, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your help on today's call. Uh, we'd really like to thank everyone who dialed in or listened to the webcast for their participation. We know that many of you are going to have follow-up questions, so Jeff McLaughlin, George Price, and Jim Sullivan are available after today's call. Please stay healthy, and all my best to you and your families. Operator, this concludes our call. Thank you all, and have a fantastic day. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's call. Thank you all for joining. You may now disconnect.